So let's talk more about your time at the Treasury. The Department of Treasury has been a key player in regulatory and law enforcement actions against blockchain and crypto-based crime. Can you provide any insight to how the department approaches topics like blockchain and crypto and regulating these tech yeah, technologies? Yeah, so, so funny story. So this is actually a true story. Um, so I oversaw the Future of Money initiative on behalf of Treasury. And uh, blockchain was still very, very new to everyone. And, and, and I kind of have to separate that a little bit because when that first kind of hit, hit our, our radar, there was kind of an interagency policy group that came together to really kind of understand what it is in the first place. I mean, that, that concept, even back then, was so novel. But I got to also tell you, so I oversaw the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, where we print our, our paper bills, and the US Mint, where we produce our coins. And I was literally given the direction around the 2010, 2011 timeframe that I should start winding down operations of currency and coin production because no one's going to use it anymore. This was some people's opinion. Uh, and because Google Wallet was kind of making their, their, their stake at that point coming out and, and kind of guns blazing, and I just didn't buy it. I just didn't believe that that was going to be the case. And at the time that I joined uh, Treasury, there was about $850 billion of US currency in circulation worldwide, and we were producing about 3 billion coins. And the way that demand is taken in terms of the orders is based on the Federal Reserve through the banks, right? So the banks give their orders to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve gives their orders to us at Treasury, and then we produce the amount, again, purely based on demand. And everyone, again, there was a good group around me who were just assuming that because Google Wallet was out, that somehow we should be unwinding. And again, the way I look at demand is it usually follows the path of GDP historically. Consumer usage of cash usually follows almost the exact trajectory as GDP growth. So at the time, we were producing 2 to 3 percent. So my reaction to that was, well, gosh, that's not what history has shown us. I think we should still keep going. And in fact, if the Federal Reserve gives us these orders, these projections, that's what we're going to do. We're not unwinding. In fact, we should prepare for more coin and currency demand. So what do you think happened? So I told you at the beginning, there's $850 billion of US currency in circulation worldwide. We were producing 3 billion coins a year. What do you think it was when I left? Any guesses on what the currency in circulation is around the world today? US currency from $850 billion to? 2.2 trillion. Now, some would say that's store value, right? That's mattress money, suitcase money, wall money, which it is. But look at the coins. Again, we're producing 3 billion coins a year. What was it when I left, you think, eight years later and still exists today? Anyone? Any guesses? Say it out loud. 16 billion. So wow. demand increased a lot more than anyone anticipated, even more than I anticipated. And I think the takeaway from that is consumer behavior is the hardest to change. And in this case, it really was about optionality. People just wanted more options. And because US currency is accepted worldwide, it's, it's liquid, it's, it's obviously government backed, it's secure it makes a big difference in how people want to use it. So it continues to be in demand, by the way. So speaking of the demand for currency, blockchain has enabled others to mint currency of sorts. What do you think about this? Is it a good, is it a bad thing? And what are the legal complications that come from printing your own money? Yeah, so people should, just for, for disclosure, I'm on the board of Ripple, which obviously produces XRP. So I am a huge supporter of this world of blockchain, this world of digital currency, uh, and this world of providing options especially for this next generation, um, millennials and post-millennials. It's all about optionality for them. It's all about ease of use. It's all about access to your phones. If you're not on the phone, if you're not on TikTok, you're 10 steps behind. Uh, and my, my, my son, my little Goldman Sachs, rock, Goldman Sachs rock star who just left to start his own uh, crypto real estate on, excuse me, crowdfunding real estate on the blockchain funded by Tim Draper, by the way, first seed investor. So, so happy for him. So again, I live this. I live this every day. Um, and I support the optionality. That being said, what you're going to hear me say all the time when it comes to this kind of innovative way of, of having people uh, conduct commerce, there has to be guardrails. There has to be a framework. There has to be tracks in place in order for the train to move forward. And again, this is where it's hard for the government because we're not always in that first car. We're usually in the caboose trying to catch up. But I do believe in that optionality. I do believe that everyone, this kind of financial inclusion, access to all types 
of ways of commerce. It's, the train's already left the station. It's already happening. It's us, it's we who have to catch up. So, but what are some of those guardrails look like? What are, what have been some complications? I'd love to ask you about Ripple, but I won't do that to you. Tell us about like Tether. So what do you think are the complications of starting something like Tether? Well, all right, so, so Tether's a good one. I mean, obviously everyone knows that Tether uh, was intended to be a stable coin matching USD dollar for dollar, which, which sounds great, right? That's the one thing about digital assets uh, in general is that the hardest part for uh, them to be really accepted globally is that they're not government backed, right? They're not back, government backed. So we went off the gold standard. I guess it was technically 1971, although technically it was written out, I guess 1976. But early 70s, the US went off the gold standard, right? We only have, I also oversaw the nation's gold. gold. So fun fact, we have about 268 million ounces of US gold in our, in our reserves, which by the way, wouldn't even cover half of the currency in circulation out there, right? So when we went off the gold standard, it's basically what the market will bear. So Tether trying to tie themselves to a one-to-one -one is, is an interesting concept, although my understanding, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't exactly kind of one-to-one -one in terms of US dollars that they had in their reserves, <laughs> right? They had other assets in there. I think now they're buying up treasuries. So I think it's changed over time. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they also are saying that it's not necessarily US dollars that they have in their reserves to compensate for what's out there. I think that's true. It was exactly not one for one at pretty much every time in Tether's history. So, yeah. <laughs> there it is, right? It's a good concept, because again, that is the one thing. It's, it's when you think about the government-backed uh, you know, currency that makes it much more tolerable for other people to use. So I, I should have known this having served in the government, but you're answering all the questions very clearly and succinctly, and I'm, only, I'm down to one last one, and I had extra questions prepared. So take your time with this one. We might have one audience question time. <laughs> uh -oh. So be kind. Re recently, um, the, the OFAC, which is part of the Department of Treasury, they sanctioned Tornado Cash, which has been a service for effectively laundering money through you know, Ethereum. What did and didn't surprise you about this action, and what it, did and didn't surprise you about the reaction Okay, to so action. OFAC is Office of Foreign Asset Control, also part of the Terrorism and Financial Intelligence Group of Treasury. Very, very specific. So when it came for time to that, and I also I want to go back and really answer your question about how I think the government should be working about regulation and other red flags when it yeah. comes to digital assets. Let me come back to that. Don't let me forget that, because that's important. But coming back to your current question. So first of all, it's a mixer. Right? They all call themselves a mixer. And so when you're a mixer, my understanding is that you're trying to protect the identities of the individual so that you can have private transactions. You call yourself a mixer, that's a red flag already. So what surprised me about OFAC? That they didn't do it sooner. I think, I think they've been around for a while already. Yeah, many years. So, so, and I think they just did this. Is it this summer? It's like a, like a couple weeks ago. Yeah, COVID yeah. just, I can't remember anything with COVID, but but um, so, so again, the fact that they took so long is interesting. But the other part that really surprised me about that, so by the way, I'm still very much involved in Treasury. I was, I was on the Biden Treasury transition team. This is actually, now I'm, on, I'm in my, first, my fourth tour of duty, if you will. So I was just recently appointed by President Biden to be the chair of the Congressional Commission that's planning the nation's 250th anniversary in 2026, four years from now. Big, big job. Very excited. It's my fourth tour of duty. But... Going back to the question, um, you call yourself a mixer, that's already a red flag. That's one. But the other part that surprised me that OFAC did, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that they actually, so what OFAC would usually do is they'd actually go after the bad actors. They would list the individuals who are being sanctioned. I think in this case, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they actually identified the code versus a person. And that's, I think, a little different. Yeah. Uh, so, so if that is the case, it's funny, I'm actually on my way to DC um, tomorrow. We're actually having a treasury reunion on Saturday, uh, all of us who served in, during the, the crisis. And then, uh, and then I'll be in treasury again this Monday. I get invited back to all the swearing-ins, which is really fun. But I, I, again, I'm still in the mix. But that is, I'm kind of interested in knowing if that's going to set an, uh, another precedent. Because when you start identifying code as the bad actor, you know, that, that's a little different. That's a little different. Uh, so again, yeah. I'm, sure there are, I'm sure there are good reasons. I don't know what the reasons are. I'm just kind of stating what I do know because I wasn't on the inside when that decision was made. 
but it made me curious though. But yeah, but yeah anytime you want to call yourself a mixer, again, that is a red flag. But let me go back to the other question about yes. how I think if I were king for the day. Um, so you probably know from the Dodd-Frank Act of 2012 financial reform, one of the, I think, very constructive pieces that came out of that was the, um, uh, uh, the FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which includes all the regulators, including the Federal Reserve, and who is the chair of the FSOC but the Secretary of the Treasury. Now, in a perfect world, the purpose of FSOC was for these regulators, these representatives, to come and meet on a regular basis, ideally on a monthly basis, and bring up some of these issues that might be new to some folks and, and might be kind of interesting for folks to kind of know what everyone else is doing. So if I were king for the day, I would think that a lot of these conversations that are happening, especially as it relates to digital assets, should be discussed at the FSOC level. Whether that's happening or not, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I do know, for example, you probably saw in February, President Biden issued the executive order directing all the regulators to submit their own white papers on what they think about digital assets. So he didn't name one area at all in terms of being in charge of this at all. In fact, I, I think it's actually the NSC and the NEC, the National Security Council and the National Economic Council, who are kind of jointly taking the lead on this. But he didn't name the SEC as the lead. He certainly didn't name the S CFTC. They're all submitting their, their research. And I'm hoping that once it is the, you know, if it is the NEC and the NSC who's leading these efforts, that as these working groups really formulate, hopefully, what could be good, hearty, constructive recommendations, those guardrails that I'm talking about, and then again, that would hopefully mean that maybe the Treasury of the Secretary, Janet Yellen, will take the lead in thinking how that kind of makes its way through. I don't think it's gonna happen in a vacuum. I honestly believe that they are gonna rely on Congress to take the lead in forming legislation. It's already happening, right? You're seeing it, although is it happening in an informed way? Are they, is, Cong is Congress making these proposals with the information that they need from the executive branch to move forward? And I think it's, you know, it takes so long to do legislation, so perhaps that is kind of a window of opportunity where some of these proposals, both from the executive level and from the legislative level, can come together. So I do think by the end of the year is the timing for when these white papers are supposed to be submitted, unless that's gonna change. And then I do think that, that Congress, along with the president and his team, will work through 2023, kind of figuring out perhaps what those legislative proposals should look like. Well, that's thank a you lot so to take on. A lot to take in. <laughs> thank you very much, Rosie.